our extended conversation with Ken Feinberg. He, the D.C. attorney who's handled the 9-11 fund, the Boston Bombing Compensation Fund, and so much more. We'll talk about his new job as well, working for the Treasury Department. Also, Victoria Soto died protecting her students at Sandy Hook. Now she's getting a school named after her in Stratford, Connecticut, her former hometown. We visited the new school and sat down with a superintendent there who was also the head of Sandy Hook on that fateful day. Then, the incredible true story of the woman who helped rebuild Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein. She volunteered to be a human shield, had her house blown up with her in it, and she became a provisional leader. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. A lot of interesting conversations this evening. And tonight, we start with ours with Ken Feinberg. Now, you may not know his name off the top of your head, but you most definitely know his work. Feinberg, he became famous for administering the funds for the families of the victims of 9-11. He had the unenviable task of determining just how much each family members should receive. Now, after that, Feinberg, he handled the BP Spill Fund and the Boston Marathon Bombing Fund and a lot more in between. He's always taken on the tough cases, starting with U.S. soldiers in Vietnam who are exposed to Agent Orange. Earlier this week, I sat down with Ken, and we spoke about all of that, plus what he's handling now. Alternative dispute resolution. Uh, is that a fancy way of saying that uh, you're separating the lions and the gladiators and trying to come to a consensus, and we're going to get into it in a whole variety of different cases? Exactly. Alternative dispute resolution is a, a phrase that encompasses many forms of dispute resolution, negotiation, face-to-face, negotiating with your adversary, mediation, where you bring in a third-party neutral, a mediator, to try and help the parties voluntarily uh, um, uh, resolve their dispute, arbitration, very popular, in which one, two, or three selected arbitrators hear the facts, no jury, and um, reach a binding decision on the dispute imposed on the parties, and finally, of course, trial, which is uh, the main way in this country from the time of the beginning of our nation that judge and jury, uh, lawyers, uh, that is the uh, primary way that we go about resolving disputes without resorting to violence. Well, let's get to the beginning of your career, at least in this aspect, 1984. Um, you're asked to, in effect, mediate uh, 250,000 uh, veterans who were victims of Agent Orange. Um, and you mediated both of their claims and obviously the manufacturers of that. Did you have any idea back then that we'd be sitting here in 2015 and we'll go through some of the more uh, infamous cases you've uh, been in the middle of that you'd still be doing this? This no. would become your career. No, no. I'm a perfect example of somebody who ended up engaged in a profession that he never trained for, that he never anticipated, that he never thought about in his wildest dreams. You're right, Agent Orange, allegations brought by thousands of Vietnam veterans that their illnesses were due to Agent Orange herbicide exposure while serving in Vietnam. That was the beginning of a career in mediation and alternative dispute resolution that I had never contemplated or thought about. It just happened. We'll talk separately about um, the September 11th fund and, and, and the challenges and, and also some of the life changing uh, both on a personal and professional level that it led to. But the gamut of the cases, and I'm just going to touch on a few here, but you have the tragedies, the shootings at the Virginia Tech, the Aurora shootings, the Boston bombings. Uh, you have uh, cases where corporations, whether it be BP um, or, or others, um, General Motors, a and then you have I guess the outliers is a Bruder film, et cetera. Is there commonalities between all of them, or do each case, um, it's not the math or not even the law, it's that you have to look at each one individually? Well, you have to look at each one individually, but there are, I would say, two commonalities, as you put it. First, in all of the, uh, the individual cases that you just referenced, Policymakers, whether it be a judge, a juror, a judge, Congress, a president, a governor, a mayor, policymakers decide in all of those examples 
there ought to be a better way to resolve the dispute other than going to court. And the second commonality in all of those cases, however different they each may be, very emotional. The emotional aspect of the tragedy, of the dispute, trumps the substantive consideration of resolution. The tragedy of September 11th happens, and again, you were asked um, to do the near impossible with all the victims of all the various walks of life to come up with a compensation uh, distribution um, that would approach, um, if not justice, some form of equity. I know you'd run into, obviously, the human emotion of it before, but from your book, it was clear you weren't even prepared for the level of pain and anguish and frustration. And if you could share um, that widow, that firefighter's widow's conversation with you in terms of, wait a minute, I have a hero who ran into a building um, who never made it out, and I have someone who basically made money on Enron, and there's a different uh, payment system for the two. It surprised even you who'd been doing this for a while. Stunned. I learned that um, human emotion is diverse and different as human beings are diverse and different. You give an example. I would say to a firefighter's widow, your husband died in the World Trade Center, you're going to receive from me tax-free $2 million for the death of your husband. But I didn't realize until 9-11 Everybody counts other people's money. Mr. Feinberg, you're giving me $2 million. Wait a minute. You're giving my next door neighbor, whose wife was the, a banker at Enron, $3 million. Why are you demeaning the memory of my husband? You never even met my husband. And yet you're giving me a $1 million less for a firefighter's death than a banker helping Enron. But there was a time, it seemed from the outside, to the uninitiated, that you were deciding. You were playing Solomon, and you were making up your own, in effect, um, you know, percentages that you were going to do the allotments. And just from the outside, it seemed somebody else ought to articulate, he's following law, and he's not making it up as he goes along, and you're not doing your own formulaic equations. You seem to be out on an island there for a while. Well, you're on an island for a, a great while. Now, the way you get off the island to shore, where you're safer, the more the money went out, the more the talk subsided and the actual dollars flowed to individuals, the more they saw Yes, I am getting paid millions of dollars within 60 days, 90 days, no trials, no lawyers. Um, that dampened the emotional opposition. But you're absolutely right. In all of these programs, it doesn't matter how reasonable you may be, how effective you are in following the law that's been laid down, you better brace yourself for the emotional onslaught, the emotional criticism. How many families did you meet in that process? In 9-11, I met individually about 950 individual hearings with families who either lost loved ones on 9-11 or victims who were horribly disfigured, burned, broken bones, uh, who came to see me. But it was um, very, very emotional. Was the hardest part deciding, as the book suggests, what is life worth, or was it also deciding which cases um, were legitimate and which ones didn't meet the threshold? Neither. Neither. Deciding how much to pay people, or who was eligible and who wasn't eligible, that was a relatively um, uh, easier task. The hard part was confronting families who had lost loved ones, and listening to them, and empathizing with them, and holding their hand, and hearing unbelievable stories about a wife who died, a husband who died, a brother who's uh, a quadriplegic, a sister who's burned over 80 percent of her body, um, the serendipitous nature of life and death. You're in one building, you die. You're 10 minutes late, you live. 
I mean, that's the tough part in all of these cases. Up next, more of my conversation with Ken Feinberg, including how he handled the aftermath of the Virginia Tech massacre.